to jump straight into this rather than doing lots of dull introductions. Let's talk straight away about compliance. Compliance, the most exciting thing in the world. No, really not the most exciting thing in the world. It's something that we all have to do. Um, everyone does it. Certainly any IT professionals all do compliance. It's, in all honesty, it's just an expensive way of getting a tick in the box. Traditional operations people quite like compliance. It's very clear cut. It's either a yes or a no, a pass or a fail. Um, those of you in the room who do business with me know that I border on the almost failing most of the time. But it's just something that you do because you have to. The whole premise of this presentation is that compliance by itself actually offers you very little value. So I said it's the sort of thing traditional companies do. Um, I work for Delt Shared Services and Delt is not a traditional company. Um, we're quite unusual for lots of reasons, not least because we're a private sector company wholly owned by the public sector. So we've got a public sector mentality, uh, sorry, a private sector mentality with public sector ethics. Um, and there's some numbers up there that tell you a little bit about what we do. The company's owned by two organisations who you might think would have absolutely no reason to get into bed with each other. A big city council and a CCG. And for anyone who's not from the NHS, a CCG are the guys in the NHS who get to spend the money. They don't actually do anything except spend money. And in the case of our CCG, it's the largest in the UK. Um, it's very good at spending money, so it has the largest deficit in the UK. So that's great. So I've got two big public sector customers. Um, we support more than 300 services, everything from dog poo to potholes. Um, it's astonishing the range of stuff that local councils do, and then you mix that up with healthcare, and the whole thing becomes a bit of a nightmare. Um, we've got 160 different locations throughout Devon. Um, 126 of those are GP practices. So if you have a GP in Devon, the chances are um, my team provision their IT. And if you think you know people who are not cyber aware, go talk to a GP. Um, I reckon probably three quarters of our cyber security incidents come from the GP community. Not necessarily the GPs themselves, but all of their staff. It's a big estate. Um, we're trying to save money, but we're also desperately trying to do things better, faster and cheaper, and that's why Delt exists. Yes, everybody uh, needs to invest in IT security services or solutions, and that's probably why a lot of you are here today. Um, the problem is to define and implement those technical security solutions and improvements takes specialist skills, and um, the chances are a lot of you in this room either don't have those skills or struggle to kind of create them in-house. And so the problem is you then have to go out to the market and get new resources which are expensive. The challenge there is you then have to try and retain those skills and maintain them and upskill them, keep them interested, because someone else will come along with a few more dollars and want a few more things from them. If you don't have those people, or if you find them and then can't retain them because there are more interesting jobs or better paid jobs elsewhere, then bad things happen. And one of the great pleasures of going to um, events like this is you get to hear people talking about the bad things that happen to them. Um, and that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to tell you a story. Um, it's a relatively recent story, and it's a story about Catherine the Cook. Um, just for a moment, you need to bear in mind that this happened in the days before two-factor authentication on Outlook Web Access. Now that's a massive fail, but step beyond that for a moment and let's just assume that we're back in the world before two-factor authentication. So, Catherine the Cook, one of a um, user base of about 8,500 people who we look after. Her job is not cyber security, her job is jam roly-poly. She knows nothing about cyber security and frankly probably doesn't need to know anything about cyber security. You would think. She gets a very small amount of email, maybe two or three messages a week. She only logs on once a week. And the story starts when she calls our um, first line service desk and says, guys, I've not had an email for a while. Can you um, find out what's going on? First line did exactly what they were supposed to do, went and poked around, discovered something rather strange. She had an inbox rule that said, delete all. Any incoming message from anybody, delete. Now, rather than saying to Catherine, you're an idiot, they just said, ah, oh, we've found the deeply complicated technical problem with our brilliance, and we fixed it for you. Your email will be fine now. Catherine says, thank you very much, and starts getting email again. Nobody thought anything more about it. About a month later, Catherine calls back. Says, um, you guys fixed this for me a while ago, but I'm not getting an email again. I don't understand what's going on. This time, luckily, because she'd said, I've called you before, somebody looked a bit further. 
realised the inbox rule was back again. Now this is somebody who is probably doesn't even know what an inbox rule is. How would she have managed to create an inbox rule twice that says delete everything? So we started looking a bit closer. Now at some point, somewhere, either in the office or at home, somebody had sent Catherine an email. It probably promised her um, riches and good fortune. More likely it said um, it was from the IT department and she was going to get a fantastic new computer system. She was in line for a new version of Outlook or a new version of Office or something gold-plated. She'd get a free iPad. All she had to do was give us a username and password on this form, submit it and all would be well. And Catherine being Catherine thought, oh, that's fantastic, I'll do that. Username, password, sent. Catherine is owned, only she doesn't know it. Because we're running Outlook Web Access, which is how she's accessing most of her email, our attacker now owns her Outlook account and thinks, that's rather handy. I can use the domain name that's associated with this um, particular customer of ours to gain some credibility from my spam and phishing attacks. So I'm going to send a few emails. And they did. They were quite smart in the creating the inbox rule, because if you haven't already made the quantum leap to jump there, and I thank Joe for figuring this out, um, Joe sitting in the room is our cyber security guy, is um, it was to avoid backscatter. So he was sending a fair few emails to a fair few people, and his um, email mailing lists were not that good. So there were going to be some non-delivery reports, all of which would come back to Catherine. By creating the delete everything inbox rule, Catherine never saw them. She had a nice, tidy inbox. I then had to go and explain to our customer why 400,000 spam and phishing emails had been sent from their domain over the space of about six weeks. I'll say that again, 400,000 from somebody overseas using Outlook Web Access. You have to admire their patience. And almost immediately the question that gets asked is, how did you not notice? How didn't you notice 400,000 emails being sent by a cook. Why didn't you notice somebody was logging in from overseas? Why didn't you notice somebody logging in in the middle of the night? We didn't notice. And that's quite awkward when you're trying to explain that, because people go, it's, it's obvious, 400,000 emails. Actually, if you look at our total email volume from 8,500 users, 400,000 is not that big. It's very big from one person. But we don't employ a guy whose job it is to go and count all of the emails that somebody sends. We're a slideshow. Um, we were looking. We just weren't looking in the right place. We had bought, for compliance, this is why I like compliance so much, a very expensive piece of software, a security incident and event management tool. And what that does is it looks at millions of events that take place on our network. Looks like, it looks at things like um, person X sends an email, person Y receives an email, person X opens this application. And it tracks all of those events. And then it stands back and takes a giant helicopter view and goes, out of all of those events, which ones are worth looking at? And what this very expensive tool does is then produce a volume of white noise that is so great that it's absolutely impossible for anyone to make any sense of it. The thing is completely useless. Because despite the fact um, I run a small IT company, computers aren't very good at things. They're very good at some things, they're very good at handling huge volumes of data, but they're not actually all that smart. Show a computer a picture of a cat and a dog and it can go, that's a dog, that's a cat. Show a computer a picture of a dog and a dead dog and it goes, they're both dogs. The analysis that's required when you look at something as complicated as um, threat data, or the analysis of gazillions of events still needs, and I think for the foreseeable future, will need people. And not just any people, people with a real set of um, skills, a very marketable set of skills. So we bought the tool for compliance, we gained no security from it. And fortuitously, I've been on this journey before. Um, as James said, I worked at Babcock for a while. Um, I think I had a meeting with the CIO in a lift in London where he mumbled something at me um, about, um, you need to build me a sock. And I said, oh, of course, when do you want it? 12 weeks. Actually, I want it yesterday, but I'll settle for 12 weeks. 
Um, and the CIO being who he was, I said, yes, of course, I'll go and do that for you, and then went off and found a computer and Googled what the hell a sock was, because I hadn't got the faintest idea. Turns out it's quite complicated and quite expensive. So at that point, I decided to make it somebody else's problem um, and called my best get me out of the poo project manager to discover he was on holiday. And James answered the phone instead. Yes, so uh, Giles gave me the opportunity of a lifetime to build Babcock Security Operations Centre. So thank you so much. Uh, do you know what? It was tough because when you're given that kind of project and you've got people from Information Assurance sitting on one shoulder telling you what you want and then you've got people from Physical Security on the other shoulder telling you what you want. You've got people wandering around the office going, well, we, need a, we need chicken wire, we need chicken wire. It's like we need tempest attacks. How are we going to deal with that? It can't be near the window. So you, you're wandering around and everyone has their own opinion on what a security operations centre needs to do, how it needs to be created. So off we went and we sat there and we wrote lots of project plans and we tried to work out what we needed to do. We brought experts in who told us what we needed to do and we kind of then tried to work out in what order. And in the end, we got there. But you know what? We made loads of mistakes and we spent a shed loads of cash. But we have a security operations centre in Babcock monitoring our internal networks. And do you know what? It works really well. It, it, you know, it gives us such better visibility of our environment. We have security analysts who know what they're talking about and understand what data is coming out of all these systems and can spot attacks. You know, we, we're been really proud of the fact that we've managed to shut down Flash when the last of the big kind of invulnerabilities appeared there and other parts of the SIN network will you know, we'll shut down certain vulnerabilities as they appear. We've been, able to, we've been able to react quickly as we've seen spam emails or malware come in. So you know, we had a successful outcome and then we realised that actually we could use that learning to help others to get better results that are more sustainable in a faster, more cost effective fashion. So Babcock created Babcock Managed Security Services. About two years or so ago, Babcock acquired a company called Context IS, which some of you people in the room may or may not have heard of. They're, at the time, one of, one of five organisations that were certified incident response by CESG, uh, and then they had a few other sort of um, accreditations and sort of uh, wins to their name. So having bought them, Babcock realised that actually this was a, a new marketplace that we could enter um, in a way that was maybe different to other people. So when you want to... Um, there you are. So, when you want to build something new and create a new business, what do you do? Well, you ask people, don't you? You ask people what to do and not to do. So, we went out to loads of different businesses, including Babcock, and we asked them a very simple question initially, which is, why haven't you bought a managed security service? Some of them have built their own SOC, like Babcock did, and spent an absolute shed load of money doing it, and took a long time to do it, and had lots of you know, ups and downs. Others have just literally shied away from the problem and gone, no, it's too difficult, we don't have the money. So, actually, rather than do something we're not going to do anything at all. So we looked at their responses, we looked at our own learnings from, you know, my learnings for example, and essentially we, um, we, supply, we, try, we try to supply the things that are essential to customers and not to the things that stop them buying from managed services. So we've also resourced it with experts, experts from managed services, experts from cyber security, and more crucially people from Babcock like me who've been on the journey. Do you know what? We've been the customer. So, you know, people out there who are in that security space who are thinking, what do I do? You know, we understand that because we've been there. We've been in your shoes and we've you know, called up the experts and asked them how to put a sock in and whether we need chicken wire. Um, and, you know, these are some of the things that they told us. So we heard quite a lot. We don't want a call centre. We don't want a tiered ticketing system because at the end of the day, when we're calling you, it's probably because we've got a problem. It's because we've seen something on our network that we don't understand and we need help. We don't really want to be answered and told we're number five in the queue or be told that the response time is X hours. Um, they also wanted a cost pricing model that made sense to them, that they knew they could rely on and budget over for the next two, three years rather than a kind of finger in the air that they didn't never know what it was going to cost them. Uh, and they wanted to be up and running quickly. So they're all the things that we looked at. And do you know what? We've even taken still, you know, we've even got now a friendly £80 gorilla in the room. We've got the compliance, but it's automated. So, you know, Giles can get his tick box still for things like PGP, GPG 13 and stuff like that, but it doesn't come at the cost of putting an expensive system in that just sits there and outputs compliance and doesn't tell you when uh, Catherine the Cook has been owned and there's 400,000 emails flooding out of your organisation. So. So Babcock brought together a lot of security analysts from a lot of different you know, areas. We, we, we basically created our own business. We based it in Gloucester, so we got a good sort of fallout of uh, very talented analysts from places like GCHQ, Forces, uh, Microsoft, and UK Intelligence Services. So they were critical because without them, 
you don't really, you can't really make sense of the systems. I mean, there must be people in this room here that looked at scene tools, and you know, as Giles said, they create a lot of white noise. Unless you have the skill set and the knowledge to be able to interpret that and spot the trends and spot the abnormalities, it is just noise. And what tends to happen is people just tend to turn those systems off after a while. Um, you know, we, we can all read online about examples of hacks and Target. I mean, I think Target was mentioned earlier. One of the things about Target was they had uh, they had an they had a security system. I think it was Dark Trace or FireEye, one of them. And when asked why they hadn't spotted their problems and, the, and their attack via the system, they said, well, it was making lots of noise. What did you do? We turned it off. <laughs> you know, it, it's that reaction. They didn't know what to do with the data they were getting. Um, we've also resourced our service with lots of people who've been on the Babcock journey. So I mentioned earlier that we acquire, that we, we, um, that we used, uh, we, co we acquired Context IS, for example. Well, their technical director had come in and helped us look at our, in and investigate our environment. He's now on board as our technical director. Our ops director was the guy who was the program sponsor for our um, SOC build, but also for our network hardening that came out of the Context work. So we've brought lots of people in that understand, um, understand the journey we've been on. And um, we've also got over 40 years of managed security service experience in our management team. And then there's me. So, you know, I was given the enviable task by Giles of building the SOC, both the physical space and the systems that sat within it. And um, this position of starting from scratch was difficult, but with lots of graph we got there, but there was lots of pitfalls. The biggest ones I think for us were the fact that we kept losing staff because you bring lots of contractors in, but certainly in our case, our IT department for Babcock was in Southampton and um, people just didn't want to travel that far. So you, they'd get a better offer, you know, a few more pennies on the table and they would up and leave to somebody else who was starting on the journey. Uh, you know, and I have to say, having had Giles dump this particular problem squarely in my lap, I think I can safely know, say I know how difficult it is to try and sort out this capability. So at the end of the day, it all comes down to what was the outcome of this. It, it, it might sound a bit like I still work for Babcock. I don't. I left Babcock because I got a better offer. Um, however, I went on a particular journey with them where we learned an enormous amount about cybersecurity, where we invested shed loads of money. Um, it makes no sense for a um, small or even a medium-sized organization to try and do that again, um, which is why I've ended up in partnership with Babcock, who are now delivering us um, a security monitoring capability, and it gives us a number of things. Um, it gives us that always-on defense. It's proactive, it's not reactive. They're always looking. We're always looking. We're not waiting for someone to go, oh, my email's not working. It's supposed to happen, and it does happen. We find out about the event before it's happened. Um, I've also got the advantage that I've got access to some very high-end analysts who are on the end of the phone. And when I phone, I get straight through to an analyst. I don't end up having to sit in a queue, which is something I hate. Um, the whole presentation, you will have noticed, is, is very black and white. Um, but actually, the outcomes from it are the bits that get interesting. There's a couple of quotes there. Hopefully, you're all close enough to read them. But there are a couple of comments I made in a press interview after we'd gone live um, about the service that were trying to explain um, why we'd done it. Part of the reason why Delta exists was to avoid outsourcing services out of the southwest. Now Gloucester's sort of the southwest. But we made a conscious choice. We're actually going to get somebody else to do this for us. And we're going to do it because we need, um, we need that proactive service. We need the skill set that is in such short supply, which is particularly true for everyone in the room here who's a student, um, real good cyber analysts um, worth their weight in gold. We just can't hire them. So we'll buy them from somebody else. Um, it works. Buying a very expensive tool just for compliance um, means you're gonna end up with an elephant in the room, a giant white elephant. And that's something I don't plan on doing again. So, you know, as you heard, Giles is passionate about Dell. You know, I'm passionate about cybersecurity, and actually, more importantly, we're both passionate about the customers that we serve. Uh, from my perspective, our you know, cybersecurity customers, Giles, for your two primary customers, everyone else coming on board with Dell. So, you know, for us, I suppose the, the closing words before questions are, you know, we're happy. We want to have that conversation with you. <laughs>